Welcome, everybody. Um, it's great to see uh, so many folks here. Um, many of you are, are old hands at these calls. I think this is our 40th Agents of Impact call. Um, and we're uh, delighted to see some new folks as well. This one is Political Risk and Impact Investing in Ukraine um, and, and, and elsewhere. Um, and uh, what, let me first off bring in my colleagues, Dennis Price and Amy Cortez, uh, who've been writing about this. We've all been writing a lot about it, obviously, in the last few weeks. Um, and um, we were trying to, you know, sort of get our heads around, you know, how we, how, you know, how, how this is, uh, what this means for impact investors. And, you know, the, the invasion of Ukraine, you know, upended calculations of political risk. Um, not only in Ukraine, not only in Russia, but elsewhere, China, developing countries, emerging markets, other places. Um, and it's not always possible uh, to avoid uh, political risk, especially when um, that's where some of the impact is needed. Um, uh, Amy, you wrote about, uh, about, uh, about Open Road. We'll bring in Caroline in a minute. Um, join the call. Um, yeah, and as you were saying, David, the the you know impact investors don't always have that ability to just flee or divest when they want to help the people on the ground in some of these um, conflict torn places. Um, and uh, I, I think you know it, it's a lot of the world, right? Two thirds of the world's extreme poor could live in these kind of settings of fragility, conflict, and violence, um, according to the World Bank. So. Um, it's Ukraine, but it's a lot of places. Yeah, Amy, what we're what we're what we've learned in, in some of the reporting um, and elsewhere um, with guests from guests on the call and others um, is that some impact investments can actually help mitigate some of those risks. Um, investment in, investments in a free press, for example, and financial inclusion. Um, sustainable development goal number sixteen um, actually promotes peace and security. Um, and it's, it's one of the least funded SDGs. Um, and in, back in, I think, 2017, we wrote a piece um, that included some of the guests on this call um, that said, yes, peace, justice, and strong institutions are actually investable. Um, so that, that sort of plays into this discussion as well, so some of those opportunities. Great. Well, that's a, that makes a great time to introduce the guests. So let's say hello to Jessica Blazer. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you. Um, you're a partner at the private equity firm Sigma Blazer, um, and you've invested uh, over a billion dollars in Ukraine over the last 25 years, um, and we're, uh, we're delighted to have you with us. Um, Harlan Mandel. Um, hi there. Hi, Harlan. Um, uh, you lead the Media Development Investment Fund, um, which has invested more than $100 million um, in, in press freedom in, I think, more than 40 countries. Um, I was... Uh, taken by the fact that in 2016, you lost your whole portfolio in Russia when MDIF was declared undesirable by the Russia's prosecutor general. Um, and uh, Daniel Kozlov, um, um, re recently of Moscow, but now coming to us from, uh, from India, I believe, Daniel, welcome. Yeah. Um, I've known Daniel for, for a little while. Um, he's the, uh, one of the founders of the Global Venture Alliance a kind of network of accelerators that's worked with thousands of entrepreneurs, including in Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, and, and other countries around the region. And um, finally, Caroline Brassan of Open Road Alliance, um, another old uh, friend of Impact Alpha's. Um, happy 10th anniversary, Caroline. Thank you. Um, welcome. And uh, Open Road, as many folks here know, um, uh, and has been on Open Road has been on earlier calls, um, specializes in these kind of short-term bridge loans that help uh, social enterprises and impact enterprises get through what I think you guys call unexpected OMG moments, um, uh, where and 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 I think have lent something like fifty million dollars to over a hundred uh, social enterprises. So um, welcome uh, everybody. Let's just start with uh, with Jessica. Um, Jessica, maybe just set the stage a little bit. Tell us about you know how 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 you're personally involved with with Ukraine, just so folks understand the context. Absolutely, and thank you again for having me, and thank you for all the panelists for joining today. I'm looking forward to speaking with everyone. 
Um, so I am first generation American. Uh, my family is from Ukraine. My parents emigrated from Ukraine as did much of my family in the late seventies and early eighties. Um, when they left, they vowed never to return again, uh, never to step foot on that soil again, but lo and behold, Soviet Union fell. And uh, in the mid nineties, my family, my father and my uncle, along with a third partner from Ukraine started Sigma Blazer, uh, private, the first Western private equity firm in Ukraine. So since around 1995, we've invested over a billion dollars in Ukraine. We've had over 30,000 employees um, and we've evolved since then. We've, we've uh, invested in Ukraine as well as other former Soviet Union countries. Um, and now we're also investing in the States. Uh, in addition, we do have our uh, charitable foundation of 501c3 in the US, as well as a nonprofit organization under Ukrainian standards in Ukraine called Dar Charitable Foundation. And since the war began in 2014, um, we have been ramping up our efforts to provide humanitarian aid. We were originally focused on um, orphans and children with special needs, as well as cultural and historical uh, preservation throughout Ukraine. And um, now that the war is full scale, unfortunately, we have fully devoted ourselves to uh, providing aid to Ukraine. Um, I want to I want to follow up, but, but I, I realize I forgot to uh, mention one of our traditions on these calls. It's for folks to introduce themselves on the chat line, and some some folks have old old, old hands, but uh, everybody should go ahead and and just um, say hello on the on the chat and maybe where you're from and 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 where you're working or what you're working on. Um, Jessica, just give us again the context of where it stands now with Sigma Blazer's work and the Charitable Foundation's work in Ukraine, you one of the partners is, is still there, I understand. Yes, so many of our colleagues are still there. Our third partner, um, the third founding partner, Valera Dioma, is still there. Um, he was able to get his family, his children and his wife across the border, they're safe. Um, he stayed behind and he's managing, overseeing our operations and logistics on the ground there to be able to provide the aid that we need through Poland and Slovakia and Romania. Um, you know, our portfolio companies, we had been, our funds in Ukraine, we had four funds that were coming to an end of life in Ukraine. And so we were, um, you know, working with impact investors and other investors and seeing that the, the appetite for Ukraine was uh, coming down anyway. So we were um, divesting from our portfolio companies. We still have a very large agricultural holding there that spans the entire country across every region, um, as well as a confectionery factory. Um, and so all of our- Confectionery means, means chocolate? It's chocolate, it's candy, it's biscuits, it's waffles, mm -hmm. it's a little bit of everything. And I understand some of that has made its way to the, to the front lines. Um, uh, some of that chocolate and can and candy. Indeed, it has. Yes, we were able to donate um, ten thousand pounds of chocolate to to the front lines, and that was our literally our last batch of chocolate because, um, unfortunately, Ukrainian entities aren't able to get grivnas transferred into any kind of usable currency right now. So when most of our goods, most of our supplies for the chocolate items, cocoa butter and things like that came from Western countries, which we can't access anymore. So we've been working on mostly um, biscuits and waffles at this point. And, and that is continuing to be donated to the front lines as well as we actually just got a great order from um, Western Ukrainian railroad lines that are still operating normally and they need to feed people. So that's been good. Jessica, when we spoke the other day, we were talking about risk calculations and you made the point that Ukraine has long had political risk, but mm -hmm. this is a different order altogether when you literally have bombs falling. And I think one of your offices was even demolished. Can you talk about that a little bit, the pre-invasion and what it's like now and how you navigate those, you know, those fluid uh, risk calculations. Absolutely. Political risk is 
our friend, <laughs> if you will, it has to be. It's undeniable when you're trying to invest in countries like Ukraine. Since its formation as, a, as its own nation, it has had massive amounts of political risk and it's never been a straight trajectory. It's important to understand that there are always ebbs and flows in the country and you have to adjust constantly to be able to account for those. Um, and you have to be very realistic and open and transparent with your investors about what's going on. And um, that's why we've been able to survive as long as we have in Ukraine. But you're right, when, when the war started in 2014, that was the first time that really our organization and our family, since we're from Ukraine, sort of had this complete aha moment of this is a whole new ball game that we are not experienced in. We haven't invested in countries that are in conflict situations. Um, we've dealt with easier political risk and um, we had to adjust. And, and what we found was that our policy of preparing our entities from a financial and a governmental standpoint ahead of time to be free of debt, free of credit, to have plenty of cash on hand had prepared us well to withstand any problems. And that continues to be the case now for our remaining portfolio companies. They, unlike most entities in Ukraine, are actually well positioned to weather the storm. Now, give it a year, especially for our agricultural company. Um, yeah, in a year, we're going to be in the same position as everybody else in Ukraine. But for now, we're certainly able to weather the storm. Let me just dig one 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 level deeper because you were you were telling us about sort of the 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 fits and starts of the of reform in in Ukraine and and I imagine you know different administrations come in different regimes different different environments but how, how do you just you know you know stay afloat through all of those all that turbulence? It is before the, even before the invasion. Yeah, it's incredibly important to be very well sort of entrenched in the local space. So you can't be a Western private equity firm with operations and investments in Ukraine. You must be a Western private equity firm in Ukraine. And so that has always been, yes, while our headquarters are in Houston, we have all been traveling back and forth months at a time consistently for 25 years um, to be in Ukraine. And we have also established one of the largest local employee organizations. So we understand that you can't have this outside perspective. You have to have locals that are with you and that can help guide you. And because we have our own history with Ukraine, we have an intimate understanding of how the country works, of the culture, of the problems, the pluses, the minuses. And so we're able to account for those things. There are partners and investors that have trouble understanding that, but that's sort of where we come in as a guide. And then by the same token, you know, I guess there's some glimmers maybe of, of, of hope in, in some of the negotiations going on. So at some point, in some fashion, the conflict will either end or at least abate and at, at some, at, at, to some extent. You know, how will you think about investing in, in that post-conflict, if I can use that word, um, environment? We, like all private equity firms, are at the mercy of investor appetite. And that is something that, as I mentioned, we our fund lives in Ukraine have, had already been coming to an end. And investor appetite was saying to us, we're tired of seeing the slow progress on reforms, the up and downs, the color revolutions. And so there, as much as we wanted to invest further in Ukraine, it was very difficult to engage private investors in that. What we have been trying to shift to is an understanding of impact investing at a broader level. So it's not just environmental, it's not just social or, or governmental, it's a broader concept of investing in the future of a country and that that's what the future of Ukraine requires. And we are firmly committed that when Ukraine is ready to be rebuilt, we will be on the ground. We will be there to help rebuild the country with the support of private investors as well as public entities. And just say one more thing about, about public entities because you were saying that there is gonna be a role for private impact investors, but there's obviously gonna be a role for all the kind of public and quasi-public institutions to do various role. kinds of risk mitigation and, and other things. Absolutely. It's a huge role. Uh, it's beyond the idea of providing political risk, which 
political risk insurance, which things like the European Investment Bank can provide, certainly, or sovereign debt risk and things like that. That's great to have, but what we need is skin in the game. And that's going to be highly important when we come to rebuild in Ukraine. We're going to have to show that these other nations are willing to put their own funds on the table, including the Ukrainian government. And that is something that they're very open to, to showing that they stand with the investors and they're ready and prepared to face the same consequences, but also to support in the growth, to ensure that they're all on a level playing field. Great. Well, let's uh, stick with us, Jessica, but let's turn to, uh, to Harlan Mandel, Media Development Investment Fund. Um, and Harlan, you've got some current, and I know uh, uh, former investees in Ukraine. So just, just give us a little context first, and then, then we'll dig into the broader questions. Thanks, David. And thank you for uh, inviting me to participate. Um, uh, it's a very interesting subject that, that's uh, really central to what we do. Um, so we, Media, Develop Media Development Investment Fund, we're a, a US 501c3, um, and we, um, I guess we're an impact investment fund in today's current parlance. Um, so we provide financing for independent media companies in countries where a free press is under threat. Um, so uh, to date, we've uh, provided uh, about $220 million in financing to companies in, uh, as you said, about 40 countries. We have a, a little over 100 million invested at the moment. Um, we started working in, and we, we provide financing, and then we provide a lot of um, uh, what we call capacity building uh, around that, particularly helping people um, uh, improve their abilities to manage these businesses, um, along with a fair amount of strategic advice. Um, and my colleague, uh, Pat Bird, is actually on the call, who, who runs our media advisory services division. Um, we started working in Ukraine in 1998 um, with our first investment. Currently, we have um, four companies that we're invested in, um, and then an, another company that uh, uh, has repaid their loans, but still is part of our network, so to speak. Um, and they are um, based in, um, so out of those five, four of them are local media, based in Melitopol, Kherson, um, uh, Bukovina, and Lviv. Um, and then one uh, national media, uh, a digital media company um, based in Kiev, but with national reach. Um, and the, the, you know, their experiences have really varied by location. Um, Melitopol and Kherson are occupied. Um, those uh, uh, right up until the point of, um, let's say, completion of occupation, they were um, still providing news, um, both in print and online. Um, they are shut down at the moment. Um, the, our, our clients in the west of the country are, are still operating um, uh, and also trying to, especially, for example, our client in Lviv is the largest Ukrainian language newspaper in the country. And they're also trying to provide support to other media in the country as well. Um, the, from a business perspective, um, you know, as Jessica said, kind of war is kind of a, it's a level of political risk that one um, can't really hedge for, I would say, in any kind of way. Um, so at least particularly in, in our field. So obviously the advertising market is completely dead. Nobody's advertising in the current environment. Um, so um, uh, on the other hand, the, the um, reliance on these companies for their information has you know, increased dramatically in a sense, which is you know, typical in moments of conflict. And you know, since this is a moment of extreme conflict, um, the, the uh, increased traffic is notable. So for example, um, uh, the digital media company that I mentioned that has nationwide coverage, their uh, traffic has doubled over the course of the war. Um, and they currently have about 15 million unique users. Um, the, so it's so it's you know kind of uh, v v vital information uh, and increased demand for that yeah exactly exactly so where the the the, the um, revenues have completely crashed 
demand has you know, doubled. So it's, it's, it's a conflicting trends there in a sense. Um, so in order to um, help folks now, the major needs that media companies in Ukraine have are one, cash, because there's no revenue coming in. Um, uh, two, newsprint. So most of the newsprint, virtually all of the newsprint used by Ukrainian media came from Russia. So there's this uh, uh, huge need to uh, uh, acquire newsprint in other parts of Europe and get it into the country. Um, so that's one thing that we've been engaged in. And then the other major need is um, body armor um, and bulletproof vests, mm. black jackets, helmets um, for journalists who, can, who are you know, trying to cover the conflict. Um, and those have been in, in very short supply. So we've been um, putting a lot of energy into trying to identify and acquire those kinds of materials and then get them into the country. Um, the, um, the kind of support, I mean, I think everybody sees it all over the world. The support for Ukraine has been um, uh, really remarkable. Um, so we've been able to raise uh, some significant funds virtually overnight in order to cover the cost of doing these things and to help support um, the, these media with grants you know, in, in this time when they have no income. Um, the, the, but you know what, kind of stepping back, um, you know, because of the nature of what we do, political risk is kind of, it's kind of our business model, right? So we're financing companies that generally um, face uh, uh, significant political risk um, beyond the normal kind of country level risk. Um, specifically, you know, they're often um, in a, uh, a challenging relationship with their governments. Um, and so uh, kind of assessing those risks and the ability of the companies to manage those specific kind of risks is part of our investment process. And it's a risk that, um, um, you know, we, we have to take that risk if we're gonna follow our mission. Um, but again, I think war is, is, is a risk that no, one never really contemplates when, when thinking about that. Um, the consequences though are, are similar, right? Because you can have companies that are literally deprived of revenue. For example, there's an advertising boycott. It, it's not that different from having a collapsed advertising market. Um, and you know, as Jessica said, part of being able to withstand that process and manage that risk is building up a strong enough economic base um, so that uh, companies can withstand that kind of pressure. Harlan, this, aside from things like political risk insurance, what are the ways that you said political risk is part of your business model? How does that show up in your investment process, in your due diligence? Um, how, are you mitigate, how are you preparing to mitigate um, when you go into an investment? So, you know, I think, first of all, it's people, you know, so the, the people who are running these companies, um, I mean, I remember the first time I got involved with this 25 years ago, I was amazed at the ability of um, uh, news organizations and the journalists and media managers who, who, who lead them to navigate these environments, you know, um, uh, it, 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 it was surprising that you could have independent media actually operating on the market in a place like Serbia during the wars in, in the former Yugoslavia. Um, uh, and so assessing the leadership of these companies you know, and their understanding of um, their environment and their, uh, uh, their, um, um, their judgment in, in navigating those challenges is a key part of our process. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, one of the challenges for companies like this, for media companies, if they have um, compromised ownership, it's a, a significant risk to their operations and their ability to, to um, uh, withstand pressure because in a way that becomes uh, a, a, a place where they can be targeted. So we spend say, a lot say of- say what you mean by compromised ownership, Harlan? So if, if you have um, owners who, who can be subjected to um, uh, criminal prosecution, for example, or um, who uh, uh, um, 
provide an argument that a company actually isn't independent, but is serving some other purpose. Um, all of those are, are ways that can undermine the, 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 the business of a company and open them to attack both you know, at the public, um, public relations level, but also at, at uh, a level of prosecution um, uh, or threat of prosecution. So we spent a lot of time um, digging very deeply into ownership. Um, you know, in, in a lot of these countries, it can be hard to identify ultimate owners. You know, we will not work with any company where we cannot identify ultimate owners. Um, and so that's you know, one major uh, way for us of mitigating risk. Um, Arlen, could you give us just a few examples of places where you are operating and maybe the impact that's had in keeping open the, you know, free press and, and uh, you know, combating misinformation? Sure. Um, I mean, we work in, in, you know, so it's unfortunate that there, the number of countries in the world that uh, do not have a free press is incredibly large. It's the vast majority of countries. Um, the last figures had, um, I believe, uh, over 85% of people on the planet live in countries without a free press. So it's a huge, huge problem. Um, and um, the, the, so, so we work in countries where free press is under threat, but there's limits to that. You know, so there are countries where, for example, China, where there is no independent media, so we can't work in China. Um, and there are other countries where there may be independent media, but their ability to operate uh, on a commercial basis, um, given the, the, the um, levels of government pressure that they face, um, are, is not possible. So you, you probably have grant funded media in, in countries like that, but they can't be invested in or provided debt financing. Um, and then we're limited, there needs to be some basic rule of law in the countries where we operate, where we believe we can enforce a contract. Um, so, um, uh, we're, so we're in kind of the middle of, of that um, uh, um, range of countries. Um, so we work, um, I mean, it's a long list, as, as David said, it's 40 countries or, or more, but we worked in um, many countries of the former Soviet Union, you know, so Ukraine, Russia, Georgia, Armenia, um, Moldova. Um, in, uh, we've worked, I guess, in every country of the former Yugoslavia. Uh, in Southeast Asia, we've been very active in Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Cambodia. Um, uh, we have a, a, a lot of work that we do in India. Um, and then in Africa, we're very active throughout most of Southern Africa, um, as well as Somalia, Ethiopia, and we're about to actually start a new uh, large kind of, uh, uh, innovation program in Nigeria, where we've also had some projects. In Latin America, um, we've worked in Guatemala and El Salvador and Brazil, Colombia, Peru, Bolivia. Um, and I see what you, uh, I see what you mean now, Harlan, yeah. when you say political risk is your business model. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's um, it's a long list, and unfortunately, as you said, it's it, you know it's a long list of very problematic countries when it comes to press freedom. But but you can't avoid them if you want to have the impact that 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 you that you're that you're looking for. Well, um, thank you so much, Harlan. Stick stick around, but let's move to Daniel. Koslov from the Global Venture Alliance. And, and Daniel, I spoke with you a couple of weeks ago. You were in Moscow. Right. Um, and now you got out of Moscow with your family. Um, 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 just give us a little context of what it, what it felt like in Moscow in the early days of the invasion. And then, and then we'll get to the work you've been doing with entrepreneurs. Yeah, sure, absolutely. I think it was actually a very interesting, I mean, interesting experience because it felt like you went to bed in one country. And I mean, we knew that the country was authoritarian and we knew it had problems with all sorts of problems from freedom of press, which has been mentioned. And it's actually, to what Harlan was saying, it was probably one of those countries where there was free press, was is the key word. Even, if, even a few weeks ago, there was still some free press, but because of how the government treated them, they had a lot of trouble operating and even you know, independent financing or like, foreign financing was very difficult to get because they were immediately labeled a foreign agent and uh, 
you know, with all sorts of issues following that, but it was still a place where you could uh, still fairly speak, freely speak your mind, uh, could operate, you know, could do a lot of things. Um, and uh, then literally within a week, it basically unraveled itself or composed itself, whichever way you want to put it, into a police state. And I don't really have any more way to accurately describe it, but it's actually a police state with everything from laws that uh, you open your mouth, you go to jail, and that could be uh, calling war a war, not special operation. Uh, call a saying anything against the Russian army. Um, actually, uh, there is, I think, I believe a jail term now for offering any support to Ukraine, uh, you know, this could be, and it doesn't specify which support. So I don't know, uh, calling my friends in Ukraine or my partners or uh, our team, development team in Ukraine and saying, you know, I, I'm with you guys, I feel your pain, you <laughs> might be qualified as something. And now these laws got passed very quickly. Literally every day there was something new. Over the last month, I imagine there was at least a dozen or maybe more of such laws that have been passed. I'm not, I'm going to skip the economic consequences of sanctions, which have been severe on uh, just the, the economy, the entrepreneurs, uh, the currency, uh, but it just be, be, be immediately began to feel like a very unsafe place to be in general. Wow. So you were working through Global Venture Alliance. I know you've worked with, you know, thousands of entrepreneurs. Global Venture Alliance has stood up many accelerators and sort of in innovation ecosystems around the world, you know, in, in, in many different contexts. Um, your entrepreneurs must have a keen sense of the political risks, um, but yet, you know, that they, 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 they persevere. Just tell us a little bit about what you're, what <clears throat> you're, what you're hearing from your, from your network. So I, I think perseverance, you, you, you use that word. That, that was one of my key words I always used for uh, a key quality that any entrepreneur should have. Because I think one of the key qualities that defines a good entrepreneur is perseverance in spite of not just political risk, but anything that they face. And traditionally entrepreneurs in the countries we worked in, and that, that's India, that's Middle East, that's most of the uh, you know, ex-Soviet Union countries, Brazil, US obviously where we have an office in you know, California, but most of them did not face any significant political risks, but they faced all sorts of other risks. They faced competitive risks. Um, also they faced um, risks of hostile uh, actions by bigger companies. Sometimes there, I wouldn't call them political risks, but I would call them sy systematic risks in countries where corruption was uh, widespread, such as Russia, uh, even to some extent in places like India, you could have issues with tax authorities and others being used against you as an entrepreneur to basically either, you know, in a competitive battle or to take over your company so the company can be taken away. And we've seen some of that, but perseverance is what kept entrepreneurs going. Now, this is a whole other level of perseverance that's required now. Uh, obviously, from Ukrainian entrepreneurs, it's, uh, you know, the, the amount of perseverance is immense. And people I continue to speak to there, uh, and my friends and people who continue supporting, they continue to amaze me because, uh, you know, there's this uh, company I was just talking to a couple of days ago called Fintelect. It's uh, basically, uh, kind of a financial management software out of the box for uh, you know, smaller companies and mid-sized companies. They continue to actually not just work on their product, they're actually searching to fundraise now and in the middle of this. And uh, I mean, luckily they're based in Lviv and some people are based outside of the country as well, but still, and I, I say to Igor, I was like, I'm, I'm just so, not, you know, not just surprised, but I'm also so proud of you that in spite of literally the, wall is, the, the world is crumbling around you right now, and you just continue focusing on the success of your business. But you know what, both him and I know, and I, I think I felt, he didn't have to say it, I felt as well as I'm sure he feels it, is that when this is over, and hopefully this will be over very soon, there's going to be a lot of rebuilding to do, but they will come out on the top just because they persevered. They will be one of the entrepreneurs that will be able to get those investments, hopefully, and move on. Fundraising. Just, is Go it ahead. all right if I comment on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that just really speaks directly to, to our experience as well. And I 
really appreciate that you said that because I was when I was talking to David and Amy the other day, I was talking about our executive director of, of DAR and how she would go into the bomb shelter, come out, into the bomb shelter, come out, and she would be working there. She would be working in an office. She'd be working in the bomb shelter. She'd be working in her office nonstop. And it's incredible, the perseverance and the grit and determination of the people there. It's unmatched. Yeah, I would, and I would, I would guess though that fundraising for a startup in Ukraine is a tough proposition right now, Daniel. But also fundraising, maybe for a startup in Russia, is going to be a tough proposition as well. The Belarus energy also, because Belarus before you know they got smashed with their dictatorship uh, a few years ago, and you you guys have I'm sure have seen how that went. Uh, they they were also producing a lot of talented entrepreneurs, um, but. I would say yes and no, which is interesting. Going back to the example I just gave of this company, their target market is actually EU. It's not, it's to some extent Ukraine where they try the product, but EU is the key market. I mean, look, if you look at Ukraine, Belarus, Russia, none of these are big enough markets to really scale properly if you want to build a big startup. You end up going to US, EU, or some other markets. Now India is well. India is a good market to scale because the, all the big funds came in in recent years and there's actually you know, I don't know if you knew, but there's 33 unicorns, but that, that's a side note. None, none of the, the three other countries I mentioned uh, have produced anywhere close to start. So that you would always be looking outside. So it is a good time to do, to continue working. And that actually, I think, you know, just psychologically, emotionally, this is something very important for anyone who's in the war zone and anyone who is in fact in Belarus or Russia, that that's, that, that is basically seeing their world not physically being destroyed, like people in Ukraine are having their world also physically destroyed, but basically what they believe in, their freedoms being taken away almost immediately overnight, whatever was left of them, which was actually good size, it's all gone. Uh, their ability to build a future for their kids, because uh, you know, if Ukraine will rebuild, I'm sure it will rebuild and rebuild successfully with a lot of international help, I have high doubts Russia will rebuild quickly and will rebuild any you new know, successfully because of all the sanctions that have been imposed. And that will stay, in, you know, even, even when Putin is gone and his guys are gone. I think that that will remain for a while. So it, it's, it requires perseverance. And then I see a lot of people just uh, saying, okay, well, maybe then not this country. Maybe then it's time to move and, you know, um, I, I guess we, we could say we're one of those families because my wife is an entrepreneur. She built a very big startup in Russia, uh, but uh, you know the future of that company is also uh, bleak. We're hopeful, and by the way, she gets on the call every day with them in Moscow and continues to work. And and then also, uh, and it's the same. It's perseverance. Um, just le the last last question for you, Daniel. You 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 you're now. A, um... Uh, I suppose in, in exile it's in, at some level, and and so many Russians uh, 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 people are. There's kind of a kind of global global Russian talent uh, diaspora now. Um, how do you see that uh, playing out in, in the near future? I, I think it's not just Russian; it's Ukrainian and Belarusian as well. Because all, I think all three countries there's an exodus. Now the question is, how many people will go back to their home countries after this is over? And I think this is where maybe, as, I, as I'm thinking, Ukraine will get more of people immediately flooding back, whereas Belarus and Russia will not. So this is actually, and I don't think it's uh, exile, or I think it's a, it might be an opportunity. Because as I said, a lot of these entrepreneurs, a lot of these very talented people, and also the creatives, uh, have, you know, traditionally, uh, they maybe understood that the bigger market is out there, but they never brave, were brave enough to go out for it and now they're kind of forced into it so you will see I, I i've read some statistics i don't know the accuracy of them but it was actually i think by some state agency that just in the last month fifty thousand it specialists have left russia fifty thousand, and in the month of april 70 to 100 thousand more leave. and it just so it's a benefit to the markets that are receiving these people it's also potential benefit to them if they can make it there and if they can build uh, you know, a, a different future. Uh, and yeah, maybe they can show the world that, that they also disagree with the, the current stance, the regime, and maybe the one day they'll come back and rebuild the country uh, once the political regime changes. Great, thank you, Daniel. Um, let, let's move on to Caroline now. Um, 
Caroline, we have been covering Open Road Alliance since um, at least COVID, right? Because that was a big OMG moment and you guys were very active during those days. Um, political risk is, is something different. Can, can you talk a little bit about um, the nuances of political risk, um, active conflict versus you know, more of a stasis situation, like you've been able to operate in places that have conflict, like um, uh, the DCR, uh, DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? I mean, you, you know, you are there for social enterprises when they hit these road bumps, but they need to um, deliver essential services to people on the ground. So whether those things are Brexit or COVID or, um, some sort of conflict, we, which can have very far-reaching ripple effects, right, far beyond that region. So talk a little bit about that and how you look at uh, the risk continuum and where you can play. Sure. Uh, thanks, Amy, and, and thanks to Impact Alpha for, for having me here. Um, so our, our net investment horizon is much shorter than I think some of the other investors on the call. Um, we are really focused on unsticking funding and financing that that's caught in the red tape of cross-border investing. Um, so our, our kind of Ukraine example right now is with Hala Systems. Uh, they have a technology that provides seven to 10 minutes of, of notice on, on incoming bombs. Um, it's been very effective at saving lives in Syria and Yemen, and, and they're now active in Ukraine as well. Um, they were successful at raising a, around $3 million for their Series A. They were successful at securing a large government contract of around $4 million. And then that government said, well, you need to put $2 million in a cash account just to make sure you perform on this contract. So all of a sudden, all that hard work they've done to, to raise cash for their Series A, to get that contract in place, they only had a million dollars runway to execute. Uh, so Open Road gave them a million dollar loan in February um, that they had not anticipated spending on, uh, you know, entering and expanding their work in Ukraine, um, but, but now they have the cash runway to do so. Um, and, and so for us, you know, I think right now, um, around 10% of Open Road's loans and grants over the past 10 years have been due to some kind of government intervention, um, less so on, on violence, quite honestly. I think we've heard again and again that now is the time for aid, and it's not the time to ask for repayment, obviously. Um, but uh, be, because of uh, our shorter timeline, we're really thinking about how can we bridge to longer term government funding that's coming in in places like the DRC uh, in Benin. Um, we've bridged a few solar companies uh, installing mini grids that are waiting for concessions from the government, waiting for you know, large DFI capital um, to, to come in. And in the meantime, they, they need to pay salaries. They need to keep you know, investing in their impact. Um, so we give them bridge loans to get to that point. You've said before, you know, the bridge loan's got to be a bridge to somewhere. You you need to know, have some 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 sense that there's going something some money's coming in that's going to pay the loan back. I guess, right? Yeah, and, and you know, in particular, when you think about kind of the growing uncertainty in the world, um, uh, not just in in kind of um, the new world order uh, in Europe, but um, also just the increasing uncertainty around climate change. You see these large commitments, the billions and trillions of dollars. And when you stop and think, it's like, how do you get that money into the hands of entrepreneurs that are actually going to be doing the hard work on the ground, whether it's making a micro loan in Ukraine, hopefully once the, uh, uh, the conflict um, uh, is resolved, uh, or installing solar panels uh, in, in rural DRC. You have to get from point A to point B, and there's just a whole bunch of money that's getting stuck for six, 12, 18 months in the meantime. Mm. Yeah. Is there anything special you do with your underwriting to assess risk? I've always wanted to ask you that. It, we, I, it's never come up. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, for us, like like David said, um, we're really underwriting the the quality of that future cash flow, um, and so. Uh, I, Unfortunately, there's just a ton of red tape uh, when you get these large commitments. 
And um, there, we don't often take a ton of execution risk. Um, and so for us, it's really, you know, will that future investor um, kind of stick to their investment process? What's the likelihood of something dropping out? How often at a certain investment committee do deals get approved or canned? Um, those are kind of the details that we're really nitpicking into um, to try to figure out if that future cash flow is, is secure. Um. Are there other uh, uh, investments you have maybe not in Ukraine, but around Ukraine that, that have been involved with the conflict? I think you were telling us about that the other day. Yeah, um, we've made uh, a few loans to um, a, uh, an agricultural holding company in, uh, in Moldova who um, has been helping farmers there get their um, uh, organic certification. Um, in kind of smaller markets like Moldova, there was only one organic certifier um, that the EU um, uh, um, said a few years ago uh, wasn't sufficient anymore. So they needed the kind of hands-on training with the farmers to be able to get that EU certification. Um, and I think it just underlines in some of these uh, former Soviet countries how, you know, there's been a ton of incredible development done over the last 20, 30 years of, of people really trying to integrate with the EU, um, even if they're not um, EU members um, in, in um, you know, in policy. Um, and so you know, for us, when we're looking at investments right now, we're just trying to find other areas where we can um, you know, deepen those economic ties um, and and just develop the economy overall to kind of strengthen them for what's to come. And in fact, that that loan to the agricultural company is helping to fill a little bit, right? The the big gap that people are feeling um, from Ukraine, which is a huge uh, grain exporter. Yeah, exactly. So um, they're they're delivering on uh, on grains uh, to uh, to the EU, um, and I think um, in particular um, as planting season starts up, um, you know everybody's worried about what's going to happen in in Ukraine um, and how fast we can resolve this conflict so there isn't such a, a spike in, in wheat prices um, into next year. Um, you know, the knock on effect I'll say on that for impact investors is, is certainly looking now at investing in any agricultural kind of companies in Africa um, that, that might be producing more food or that can have some sort of step up moment of growth, um, because I think next year is going to be um, pretty scary for a lot of places in terms of food security. And then also, obviously, um, in energy security in Europe is, a, is obviously everybody's talking about that as a major opportunity um, for, for investment as well. Um, Thank you all. Let's open this up a little bit to the to the audience and um, and to you know a more general ex exchange here. Um, I know there's several folks on um, who put their hands up. Um, um, I know Sindhu, uh, you've been working with with refugees. Why don't you just br very briefly uh, tell us what you're up to and and um, where it stands? Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sindhu Janakaram. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called Refugee Integration Insights. Uh, we're basically a data provider uh, collecting data on how corporations are supporting refugees. Um, really fantastic panel and, and a lot of good insights. I'm, we're a data company, so I like to start with data. Um, according to the UNHCR, 10 million people have been displaced from Ukraine in the last five weeks, 10 million. Um, so the scope of this refugee crisis, I don't think we should forget. And of those 10 million, around 7 million have been internally displaced. The UNHCR calls those people IDPs, internally displaced people. And around 3 million people have crossed a border to find safety in Moldova, in Poland, getting all the way to Germany. And now 100,000 people are being accepted into the United States. A lot of what we've heard today is on that kind of first day support for refugees, finding them shelter, finding them a hot meal, things like that. And of course, that is the most critical thing you can do for a refugee. We focus though on the kind of the day two problem. So now what? You've landed in this new country, you need a job, you need some training, especially women and children are most of these refugees because men are forced to stay behind and finding support uh, for these women, frankly, uh, is the most important thing you can do in a long-term way. So. Uh, we got started, uh, me and my co-founder Ignacio, after winning the 2020 Kellogg Morgan Stanley Sustainable Investing Challenge with a product called Refugee ETF. What we noticed is that companies, multinational corporations, are kind of on the front line of supporting refugees through hiring of refugees, supporting of refugee entrepreneurs, and education and skills training. And we basically are trying to bring transparency to those corporate initiatives 
in order to bring in the investment sector. So by providing data on what corporations are doing and packaging that data up and saying, look at the impact that all these corporations are making on refugees, that will send a powerful signal to the investment community to invest in companies because of their refugee support. We're basically following the same playbook as companies like Equileap that do this for gender data or Just Capital, Just ETF. Impact Shares has five different ETFs out there uh, that are all supporting different kinds of causes. And so what we are hoping to see, uh, and I'll kind of wrap here in a, in a moment, David, is, and thank you for the opportunity to speak, is that uh, we've seen a lot of companies cease production in Russia. You can't buy a Coca-Cola and you can't buy a Big Mac in Russia anymore. And that's great. And that's a good starting point. What we'd like to see is those same companies start a hiring program in Poland, start supporting refugee-led uh, or managed businesses, start to train refugees or give them some skills to economically integrate. Our theory of change is that we need to find ways to economically integrate refugees when these crises happen, because climate change and income inequality, these are the big mega trends that are going to lead to hundreds of millions of people being displaced in the next 30, 40 years. Um, uh, crises like Afghanistan and uh, you know Ukraine right now rightfully put an acute spotlight on the refugee crisis, but this is a long-term trend and we need the investment sector to get involved and the financial sector to get involved in order to find a way to scale those efforts. So that's what we're doing, David, at, uh, at RII. Thank, thank you. Uh, like, like Harlan and MDIF, it sounds like political risk is your business model as well. Um, I, I, there's a comment in the, in, the, um, in the chat from Michael Pru, um, and you get it, Michael, you're getting at just what we're trying to talk about is how do you actually kind of underwrite these kind of conflict risks um, and it sounds like there's some some formulas that 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 you that you've developed. I mean, is, are, Michael, are you on? And you want to just say briefly uh, if you can explain, you know, the sort of nuts and bolts of of thinking about political risk as an investment in underwriting uh, an investment. Sure, uh, not so much on the underwriting side, but uh, I used to be a bond dealer uh, for one of the major banks in Canada, uh, and we're on the bond book, uh, looking at you know foreign reserves and and sovereign debt. Uh, so that was one aspect. And so political risk was very much at the forefront. Uh, did a master's. And as I mentioned in the chat, I uh, was with Swiss Peace and working on their conflict sensitivity due diligence business case, which uh, I combined with a little bit of derivatives and a forecasting model that, uh, that they were working on, um, on being able to predict when conflicts were about to arise. Uh, and through that and some adaptations to... Um, uh, financial ratio analysis. So specifically, I look at Altman Z scores, uh, but have uh, adapted them for uh, uh, the CSR and SDGs uh, aligned with the SDG. So able to look at where the impacts from conflict will be. In most cases, it's latent. Uh, and again, I'm focused on the mining sector. But as I also mentioned there, there's the original assessment or preliminary assessment that I put out specifically for those companies uh, that have operations in and around Ukraine now, uh, to be able to take a look at just how, where uh, their own company is on, uh, on conflict risk and their sensitivities to it via a number of, of channels, whether that's revenues or underwriting insurance channels or, or those kind of things. So happy to have those discussions further offline. This is a fantastic panel and learning a lot from it. So thank, thank you. Have those um, offline if uh, people are interested. Thank you, Michael. It, it strikes me, and every, this is for everybody on the panel and, or anybody else, that political risk is, you know, it, 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 it's, it's a little bit fuzzy in a sense, right? Like, it, like people have made, mentioned that um, the risks in Russia were well known for a long time, but people wanted to invest anyway. You could maybe argue the same goes on in China right now. Um, and so if you want to invest, you can conveniently ignore the risks. And if you don't want to invest, you could use it as, a, as an excuse. Um, Harlan or Jessica or, or, or Caroline or Daniel, do you have any thoughts on sort of, you know, what was not, you know, people don't see what they don't want to see and they, and they see it when they, when, they, when they want to see it? That is absolutely the case from our perspective on Russia. I mean, we've been preaching for a long time that the risk associated with Russia is huge, that yes, it's a wonderfully 
large land mass with a huge population, the potential of growth is incredible there. But the risk that we saw associated with the government and the direction the government continued to move in was entirely too great from our perspective. And people were, from our perspective, walking around with their eyes closed, their ears closed, and just saying, okay, but, but the other fundamentals are great. It's like, yes, but they're not mutually exclusive, you have to think about them all together. And it's not right to just disregard things that aren't convenient for you at the moment. You have to look at the bigger picture. Um, so absolutely agree. And one of those risks may be that your country is gonna get sanctions slapped on it and that's gonna affect yeah. the, uh, or that a country is gonna get sanctions slapped on it and that's gonna affect your business prospects. Daniel, you've got your hand up. I would actually add to what Jessica was just saying that, um, there's hard data to confirm your sentiment and not just her sentiment, but sentiment of actually hundreds of investors that have been consistently leaving Russia for the last uh, decade. If you look at the venture market of Russia before Crimea and you kind of look at the trend over the years, it certainly hasn't really grown uh, given that the number of entrepreneurs has, I don't know, grown by how much, but certainly by at least five times or six times by our statistics. At the same time, venture market has not grown almost at all and has been shrinking. So I think investors do account, have accounted for those risks and they might have not just thought about it purely politically, but they saw how uh, there were a lot of limitations as a result that of what the market could produce itself. But I actually had a quick follow-up uh, kind of for uh, Sinfu, uh, you know, it, 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 you make it, and I'm going to be kind of a bit of a devil's advocate here, make it sound very simple, like these corporations should take, you know, this responsibility, or they should act to bring in and help these refugees. On the one hand, you're helping out, and I think this is great. On the other hand, uh, the question is, the country, which just had 3 million exodus uh, of Potentially, some of the most talented people, or part of them, are very talented and you know highly educated. Uh, ideally, should receive them back. Now, once you've created a very stable, very protected, very comfortable environment for them, which you know a lot of Western countries have created mechanisms, especially in Europe, they have been good at this uh, for refugees. Uh, then the incentive to go back is immediately lower. And that, that's, that's one thing. The second, uh, speaking about political risks outside of obvious you know, zones of conflict or you know, like uh, regimes like Russia now, uh, you have local workforce that gets disgruntled, inevitably disgruntled because a lot of times they see it as a threat to their ability to be employed. So how do you guys deal with that? And I'm not saying that this is a reason not to employ refugees, but I'm saying that you have to look at it as a as a you know a system, an ecosystem. And how do you guys do? You guys actually offer solutions for those two things? Sindhu, let, hold, hold that thought for a second, okay? Because we're at the top of the hour, and I want to uh, let everybody have a final word, and then we'll do our usual um, happy hour or after party, um, uh, and we'll and we'll keep keep rolling. But let me. Give, Daniel, we may call that your 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 last thoughts. <laughs> um, but uh, Harlan and um, Caroline and, and Jessica, do you want if you want to just uh, wrap it up with even with an ask or a call to action, um, and then as I say, we'll we'll keep the conversation going. And obviously, people have to leave; they can go. But um, um, I don't know who wants to to chime in. Harlan, um, let me let me turn to you then. If you if if you just want to say a little bit about what's next. Um, well, I think a lot depends on uh, how far the Russians go. Um, so for, um, you know, one scenario that seem, people seem to be talking about now is a, a split of the country in effect, um, uh, which would leave half of the country uh, relatively intact. Um, uh, and if that's the case, um, then there's going to need to be significant rebuilding happening there. Um, and I think everybody who can can participate in that in some way, uh, it would be very helpful. Um, the the in, in as far as media goes, uh, you know, I th I think it's fair to say that the media of Ukraine will need to be rebuilt. Um, it's um, 
uh, been completely devastated. And you know, even um, you know, as, as part of martial law being declared in Ukraine, you have uh, independent media in Ukraine being shut down um, by the Ukrainian government. Um, so it, it, it's a widespread issue coming from both directions. Um, the, the, and beyond that, I would just say, Jessica, I'd love to talk with you a little bit about um, your work with um, uh, getting body armor into the country. Sure, absolutely. I'd be happy to talk to you and I, maybe I'll just take that as my jump off point to, to do my little spiel at the end, which is, I actually think it's very dangerous to continue talking about this idea that one of the potential, you know, end points of this is that the country split in the middle. We are normalizing a situation that should not be normalized. It is not acceptable, in my opinion, that we continue talking about this. A sovereign nation, and we in the West discuss the potential future of this sovereign nation to be divided down the middle. I just think it's not acceptable. And the amazing thing about the Ukrainian people is that they won't stand for it. I truly do not see them standing for it. And as Zelensky has mentioned, as the prime minister has mentioned many times, um, the Ukrainian constitution has it enshrined within itself that Ukraine is moving towards NATO and European integration. And so any changes to that cannot be made by the president or the, or the parliament by themselves. It's gonna have to be a referendum of the people to change the constitution. And I, I just don't want us to normalize that discussion because that's what we did in 2014 and look what happened. How much further will we go? We, will we allow them to, to continue with Moldova, with Georgia? I mean, what's, what's, what's next? Um, and I guess my call to action would be to please support um, Ukraine as much as possible. Um, there are plenty of amazing nonprofits in the States as well as Ukraine that are accepting uh, donations. DAR Charitable Foundation, I'll include a link to, to our fundraising site um, we are focused on humanitarian aid, food, medical supplies, pharmaceuticals. We are also providing donated uh, body armor and helmets, especially to civilians uh, and civilian volunteers, including um, journalists. That's a huge point for us and medical um, personnel. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And, and Caroline, uh, you, I told you to get to bat cleanup. Uh, well, I, you know, that's a hard act to follow. I, I would point people towards DAR Charitable Foundation um, for their donations. Um, for Open Road, uh, if you do hear of funding and financing getting stuck, um, we're open for business and, and we can respond quite quickly, acceler accelerating uh, with million dollar loans to, to make sure that um, no time is wasted um, helping people where it's possible. Thank you. Um, okay, now, as I said, it's uh, five minutes after the hour, so we ran a little bit long, but I generally try to put myself on mute and let everybody uh, just weigh in. Um, all the guests, please do stick around. Obviously, folks have to have to go, um, you know, feel free. It wouldn't be an Agents of Impact call without Yangbo. So um, Yangbo, why don't you, I know you've got your hand up. So uh, what are you thinking? Oh, definitely. And uh, thanks for that um, intervention there, Jessica, since I've seen that so much of the talk amongst, especially amongst Western academics, about splitting Ukraine or just anything that is honestly unrecognizable if you interact with those. And as myself, uh, 10 years ago, I was somewhat towards that line. But after knowing quite many more from Eastern Europe, I uh, had definitely views have definitely evolved since then, for sure. So Overall, um, this is a question to uh, everyone here, whether there is on the panel or um, elsewhere who have some insights on this. But um, in general, so how are various initiatives, so whether it's media, whether it's infrastructure, manufacturing, any of those sectors, how are they helping in general the private sector align better with uh, reforms around uh, EU ascension, especially in the case of Ukraine or Moldova, even in Bosnia and other places, or any other reforms um, that would um, really help but improve the situation, uh, better integrate to trade and investment flows um, in these regions. And um, so in general, if you like to speak at Jessica and the number of um, others, and I bring this up uh, given that it's quite uh, compelling of a topic because a couple of years ago, as I mentioned earlier in chat, overheard a Pretty compelling conversation in uh, Washington. It was actually at a coffee house in uh, Washington about 
investments in the Ukrainian uh, railway sector. So any uh, prospects on that would be uh, pretty uh, welcome on the um, private sector role in aligning with uh, broader political and institutional reform objectives. Not, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know if I'm speaking for others. I'm not quite clear what your question is. Oh, yes. Know. So yeah, just any perspectives on how might the private sector in places such as Ukraine, uh, Moldova and other places help the whole country align with the reforms necessary around EU ascension, like the various chapters in the EU ascension process, for example. Got it. I think that's a great question. Um, and it's absolutely the role of everyone in the private sector to do that. We are sort of the, the private sector is able to move a lot faster and a lot smoother than, than the public sector in terms of allowing reforms and pushing reforms. Um, and so part of you know, what Harlan had talked about, what I talked about, which is preparing our investments, the firms that we're investing in to be uh, able to weather any storm, but also making them model entities for other entities in, in those kinds of countries. So we want to be making sure that our portfolio companies are set up to essentially be able to integrate with EU systems immediately so that we can show what the potential benefit of that is things like being able to support your employees. So right now we have employees all across Ukraine that we've provided three months forward salary for, which is nearly unheard of in Ukraine. And that's because we have the financial capability to do that. We've prepared ourselves much like any Western firm would do that. And so from that perspective, I think it's very important for the private sector to, to be actively involved in that. I would actually add to that, that maybe now after the war, um, private sector will have more voice and power coming in to rebuild the country to actually talk to the government and say, look, if we're rebuilding this country, it's kind of a, this amazing opportunity at a fresh start to actually in process root out some of the current problems uh, such as corruption, et cetera, that we already had. So let's, let's work, let's work on that. And we, as people that are, obviously we're going to be putting money anyway, but we also expect you guys, to do your part in terms of not just the money, but uh, the reforms that will push us towards a brighter future. So I think it's an actually it might be an interesting opportunity for private sector to have more say and more power. If you want to come to meetings with me in the future with the Ukrainian government, that would be great because I literally pitched that entire thing to them as soon as COVID hit. I was like, guys, COVID is the time. Rip off the Band-Aid <laughs> and do what needs to be done. So absolutely agree with you there. Absolutely. All right. Well. At least they maybe at least listen. You know, the Russian government <laughs> listens only to itself now. Arlen, I, I wanted one, one follow up for you. I wonder if you could speak to the, your uh, pluralis fund um, and how the structure itself combats political risk or mitigates political risk. Uh, sure. Um, so, pluralis is a, a, a new fund that uh, we helped launch at the end of the year. Um, it's focused on um, promoting uh, pluralistic media in, in Europe, and a large part of that is fighting media capture in Europe. Um, somebody in the chat, I, I'm sorry if I not, I think it was Yang Bo actually, uh, mentioned the, uh, uh, the problems in Hungary, for example, where media capture is um, probably the most extreme case of media capture that we see in Europe. Um, but it's a problem, it's a problem throughout the world. It's become, India as well, add to that. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, the, the, and it's a problem we've been fighting you know, since we were formed back in 1996. But in Europe, over the past um, uh, recent years, it's become a, uh, uh, an accelerating problem uh, in countries that, uh, frankly, I think much of us, many of us thought uh, were, moving, was moving in, were moving in the other direction. Um, so media capture, in cases for those who don't know, it's the phenomenon where um, countries or other vested uh, political parties or governments or other vested interests uh, uh, acquire independent media and make them no longer independent. Um, and uh, <clears throat> Hungary is, is the most extreme case where when the current um, Prime Minister Orban took 
power uh, a little over a decade ago, there were hundreds of independent media outlets. Um, and today there are a handful um, and hundreds of them have been acquired um, uh, by you know, government cronies in other ways, often financed by state financing institutions. Uh, and uh, recently, all of those companies were actually donated to one government owned trust. So you now have um, hundreds of media outlets in Hungary controlled by one government owned trust. Um, so, you know, in, 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 uh, to various degrees, that's happening in many countries in Europe, Poland, um, uh, uh, throughout the former Yugoslavia, um, uh, the Czech Republic to a lesser extent, Slovakia, Slovenia, um, the, the list goes on. So we set up a fund that uh, is kind of designed to be able to combat that. And the, the part of that is the, um, the structure of the ownership. So it's structured as a holding company. It's not a, a, a typical limited partnership. It's an evergreen entity. And the investors are shareholders, so they have you know, very you know, real ownership in this. And the owners, the ownership is divided between um, European philanthropy, high quality European media companies, uh, and impact investors. And um, the, 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 the nature of the ownership of Pluralis in and of itself provides some protection for media because it's you know, a highly, rep pardon my cat's tail, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, it's a highly reputable um, um, set of owners that uh, bring kind of international credibility to the companies that they are um, uh, uh, investing in. Um, and the idea is to be able to invest in companies uh, when they are at risk of being acquired. Um, so to date, we've been able to intervene already in a uh, uh, one company in Slovakia that had already been subject to media capture, we, we were able to take out a problematic owner. In Poland, we were able to um, uh, acquire a major stake in a company that was uh, at risk of being acquired by the state-owned oil company. Um, uh, and um, in a way, in turning this, taking that back to the question of risk, um, the idea is that it, it really limits um, uh, the political risk that these companies face by virtue of having uh, an ownership that is ha much harder to criticize. I think we're, um, we promised Sindhu to uh, be able to answer uh, um, Daniel's question earlier about uh, sort of the receptivity of in the receiving countries for refugees. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question, Daniel. Um, I, I do want to kind of point out our role, like I'm not an advocate. Uh, I'm not an advocacy organization. We basically are just tracking what corporations are doing. And by providing a score, we have a scoring methodology that hopefully is the signal to send to corporations about how to improve their, their refugee initiatives to be better aligned to the economic integration of refugees, regardless of nation status. Most of the corporate we're talking big corporations. Our top scores are Unilever and Starbucks and Siemens and SAP. Most of those corporations started refugee initiatives after the Syrian crisis. We're probably going to see another wave of corporations start refugee initiatives because of the Ukrainian crisis. Um, so I would like to see more initiatives aligned with repatriation and nation building and all those kinds of things. It isn't part of our scorecard right now because our scorecard, again, is distinctly dis about the economic integration of refugees, but you raise a, a great point and, and something to consider going forward. Um, there's some great uh, resources and links uh, for aid. There's 100% Life, there's DAR Charitable Foundation um, and, and several others. Um, we'll round them up, I think in the post that we'll put in the brief uh, or put in Impact Alpha and, and, and flag in the brief on Friday. We'll have a replay, a video replay of this call as well. If anybody has uh, last words, now would be the time to, to have it or else we'll, we'll send you on your way. Um, Amy, you, you've got one, but I think you may be on mute now. Um, thank you. I, I might ask Caroline maybe to give a, a last word. I know you have some pretty strong thoughts about the impact investing community and the need, you know, if you really want to have impact, um, you know, sometimes you have to kind of rethink 
what you're expecting in, in terms of returns and other things. And do, do you want to, sorry to put you on the spot, but. No, no, that's fine. Yeah. I, I mean, I think there's a lot of talk about what SS, ESG is and if it's going far enough. But I think this is a great opportunity for impact investing to say, uh, a framework uh, a checklist is not sufficient. We need a real strategy of investment for impact. Um, and, and for Open Road, and I know for MDIF and, and others on the call as well, um, we cannot maximize for financial return and get the kind of impact we're talking about here. Um, there are absolutely cases and portions of portfolio that can get you your 20 or 30% return, uh, but you need to have a portfolio approach. And so I think this is a really important time to kind of shout from the rooftops that uh, impact first is a viable investment strategy that can preserve your capital um, and, and, you know, I think shift the balance a little bit towards um, what a uh, real stakeholder capitalism could be. Great. That's actually a very good uh, parting, parting, parting words there. So thank you, Caroline. Um, with that, I think um, let's let's wrap this one up. Um, we'll be back in three weeks. We've we've fallen into a three week calendar here, but we're going to get back to our two week calendar. But the next call will be April 19th, Tuesday, April 19th, and it's going to be about catalytic climate adaptation capital. Um, and we have some 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 exciting uh, guests and some 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 special features for that call. So uh, Tuesday, April 19th, we'll see you back on the next Agents of Impact call. Thank you to all of our guests. Thank you to all of our participants. Um, and um, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck and be safe out there. <laughs>